Okay, I think it's time to get started. This is session number six, the third week of the course on mathematical signals, uh, methods of signal processing. As I was explaining to you already earlier, we are mostly interested in the correct mathematical treatment of continuous non-periodic signal processing. Later on, we will connect it with the periodic case, with the discrete case, and actually the periodic discrete case, which is the finite case. So I will tell you a little bit later on how to connect uh, FFT methods, discrete Fourier transform methods based on MATLAB with the continuous Fourier transform, which is coming up next. But uh, because we are dealing with function spaces, signal spaces, and we will see many more, which are all hopefully Banach spaces. So they are infinite dimensional, not dis describable uh, by matrices or finite coordinate systems. Therefore, we have to apply functional analysis. Functional analysis as such is uh, for me, the combination of linear algebra with analysis in the spirit of convergence issues. We have finite sums, but we have to extend them to infinite sums, so-called series. And sometimes it's the question of whether the limit exists, belongs to the same space. And that's where Banach spaces come in. Also, later on, we will see Hilbert spaces, which are like Euclidean spaces, where the norm is coming from a scalar product. But for now, we are just dealing with the simple spaces, different spaces, which have the sup norm, the maximums norm, as a size description as a norm. Okay, and in such statements, we are coming up with Cauchy sequences and Cauchy nets. I think Cauchy sequences are very natural. You may think of approximations to an irrational number like square root of two or pi, and they are forming a Cauchy sequence if you're approximating them better and better. If you think of, uh, I don't know, an infinite sum over all the integer points of a lattice in the plane, then you can, of course, sum up over all the points, let's say a nice decent function, by summing up row-wise or column-wise, you're finding the question whether the order matters or whether you are getting the same sum. So a very natural way is to say, well, we sum up over arbitrary fin finite sets. And then we increase those finite sets to be exhausting. So you take more and more points, finitely many bigger finite sets and so on. That's where the concept of a net is coming in. Also, we'll see that compressing a rectangular pulse or a Gauss function with a parameter rho to make the support small and smaller with convergence to the Dirac measure, you would say rho goes to zero. And I would say, well, this is a typical example of an abstract parameter which can improve by getting smaller and smaller. And that's where the mathematical concept of nets is coming in. Also Riemannian sums, there are good Riemannian sums which are fine. So that means alpha is quite good. Alpha is better than beta. If the decomposition for a Riemannian sum is, more, uh, is finer than the one which has the weaker parameter. So in real life, you have a very good feeling what it means to have a partially ordered set and what is better or not. Just think of evaluations in the internet of hotels or so. In some categories, you're better, in some others, maybe not. And so it's not a linear sorting like a Cauchy sequence. A Cauchy sequence is something where you say, if you are choosing an index large enough, then you can compare every two elements which have a, such a, an index at least as big as this critical index, and all those possible pairwise differences will be less than epsilon. Now, formally, a Banach sp space is a norm space. Uh, a vector space with a norm, which is complete in the sense that every Cauchy sequence is convergent. One can show, that's a little bit abstract theory, that also Cauchy nets then have to converge because sequences are special cases of Cauchy nets. It's clear if you have a space where Cauchy nets are convergent, also Cauchy sequences have to convergence. The opposite part is a little bit more tricky, and I will not go into this. Now, we have made statements that the CB space of bounded continuous functions on Euclidean space is complete. And this is based on the fact from analysis, which we could also do here, I'll leave it out. 
that uniform limits of continuous functions have to be continuous. So the uniformity of taking limits preserves uh, continuity in the limiting case. Of course, a Cauchy sequence in CB uh, also is, has to be finite, and therefore the limit must be also a bounded function. It's a little bit more tricky to talk about Cauchy nets because Cauchy nets, which are convergent, may be unbounded, uh, but this is at the moment just a, uh, an issue for mathematicians. Now, we also have used the fact or claim that C0 is, is a closed subspace, which means if you start from a sequence where each Fn is in C0, so vanishing at infinity, the limit, which by the number one exists in the bounded continuous functions, will also belong to this subspace. So in this way, any Cauchy sequence in C0 has a limit F0, which is also in this space. So completeness is inherited by closed subspaces. So abstract statement would be, if you have a Banach space and somebody is giving you a subspace and you can take the norm from the big space, then the subspace is complete and the Banach space if and only if it is closed. But this is just an easy exercise. Now, for the characteriz characterization of, 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 of um, translation invariant systems, we need the dual space and we just call them uh, bounded measures. So a linear functional, which is not pathological in the sense of which is bounded, um, will be called a measure. And this is justified by the representation theorem, which we don't have to discuss. It's just telling you we don't have to care what, what measures are in the spirit of measure theory, we just take them as linear functionals. And we have seen there are several easy types like the discrete measures uh, and the absolutely continuous measures coming from decent nice functions. Now, um, we will also use frequently the completeness of the dual space and whereas it's a abstract statement that whenever you start, even with a norm space, you don't need the completeness of the space itself. The dual space will be a complete space if you give him uh, the standard norm, which is the subnorm over the unit ball of all these things. So you apply your functional to all the possible elements of the unit ball of the original norm space. You're getting a bunch of complex numbers by assumption, this collection has to be a bounded set. And then of course you can shrink the radius until you have the infimum over those upper bounds, which is by definition called the soup. And that's the norm. So you have a way to measure these measures, these functionals. And in terms of size, what is the size of a linear functional? And clearly this is a norm. This is an easy exercise. In particular, if somebody tells you that this expression is zero, then it means that mu of f is zero for every f, so it's just a zero functional. Now, how uh, can we prove this completeness? And I'm telling you this by showing you an even more, uh, more uh, general statement. So for me, side remark, abstractness not, doesn't mean that you have no idea what the objects are you're juggling with symbols, but abstract means I'm using the same proof actually that I would prove for lemma four as it stands here for the lemma five, but I can use lemma five because it's more general in so many more situations that I of course try uh, to do the one proof, which is then applicable to many other cases. So what is the more general situation? I'm saying you can look at all the bounded linear operators, I call it here L of B1 to B2, from one normed space to another one space. Both of them are normed, but it's important that the target space has to be a complete space. So it has to be a Banach space. And then the claim is this space of bounded linear operators has uh, again a natural norm. I use the triple par. So an element T, which maps 
elements from B1 into B2 in a bounded and linear way um, is having a triple norm. Uh, this has to be corrected here a little bit. And how do you do it? You take all the elements in the unit ball of the domain, so all the elements F in the first space with norm at most one, and you look at the size of the output. So if you compare with lemma four, in lemma four, B equals B1, and the target space is just the complex numbers, or if you want, maybe sometimes the real numbers. And clearly the complex numbers have this completeness property, which goes back to the completeness of the real number systems, which is one of the achievements why real numbers are so more important, much more important than the rational numbers. Okay, so I will try to give you by short verbal description, uh, an explanation why we have this completeness result. And it's more a statement about or showing you how to work with all these terms. So, standard role game, you're giving me a Cauchy sequence of such operators. And we look together what it means. Well, it means that uh, for every epsilon, there is an index such that things, operators measured in the operator norm will be close enough if you take only very large, sufficiently large indices. Now, what is the operator norm doing? It tells you, well, if you compare uh, two, two such things, then you can take the operator norm of the, of the operator that is applied and then the norm of the function f in the target space. So actually looking at equation which has number 37 here at the moment, I would say I should have inserted an extra term. I should tell you, well, what is the difference of these two operators, Tn minus Tm? If you apply it to an individual input signal, it would be, of course, by definition, Tnf minus Tmf. So you op uh, take the difference of operators by taking their, the difference of their values for every input signal. Okay, so I just reinterpret the left-hand side as Tn minus Tm applied to a single f. And then, of course, you, the size, the operator norm of the difference operator comes in, which is made small, and that is a fixed element. So clearly, for every possible input signal, this will be a Cauchy sequence. We don't have to discuss whether for the same epsilon uh, we get the same index because clearly for large f you may need a larger index for a fixed epsilon, but that's not the issue that we have to discuss here. Okay, now um, again a correction, Tn of f, no fn. Tn of fixed f for fixed f is a Cauchy sequence in the target space. But we know that this, or have assumed that this is a complete space. So we use the completeness to say, oh, we can go to the limit. So if we define T0 of F, this is something which at first sight is only defined individually. So for in every single F that you're giving me, I can say, well, I know there must be a limit and I give it a name, but we have to justify that this is an operator. The very first thing is, of course, to check that this is a linear mapping, that's quite easy. But we also have to show that the limit operator is a bounded operator. That means we have to control the size of this limit. And the idea is, of course, if we control the size of all these TNs, then we can, should be able to control the size in the, by taking the limit. So in fact, uh, you take these operators TN, and you can start anywhere, uh, maybe at n0 equals 1000 or whatever. Most of the time you have a common um, control on all these operators, but this is what I want to do. We can control the size of the limit operator by this. So it will both say it is a bounded operator and its actual size is controlled in this way. So we have to come back to the Cauchy condition. So for every epsilon, there is some index blah, blah, blah. So in particular, we can take epsilon equal one. And that means there is some index n zero such that for every n and m which is larger than this, the differences will not exceed one. Well, what does it mean for every tn of f? Of course, for n larger than n zero. 
you can compare it with Tn minus Tn0 minus Tn applied to F. And as we know, this is the size of the operator times the size of F. But I put in directly in, we are interested only in F in the unit ball. So there should be one, so to say, that is not written here. And then we have to take the, the remainder term, which is Tn0 of B. But Tn0 of B is, of course, the operator norm of the operator T with label N0 times the norm of F, but again, that was one. So we see that we have T and zero of F can be controlled by one plus T and zero. And that's of course, at most the soup over all the remaining operators norms. And because we have this operator norm estimate for every T and F, and then going to the limit, if all the elements are less than some constant, the limit element is by, uh, controlled by the same size. So we have um, finished this argument and uh, uh, we are done. Now, uh, I was putting this uh, at the beginning of the lecture uh, now because I thought this is abstract things which needs more concentration than some of the other things. It will be a rather theoretical talk or uh, session today. And so um, I would like to take a minimal short break and uh, tell you we're going now in the direction of verifying this identification between operators and functionals that we had for cubic polynomials. And, but now we're doing it for the signal space C0 um, and try to do it in a correct way. And correct in this sense means mathematically precise, but in coincidence with the standard concept of convolution. So actually in the course notes in the script, uh, instead of T sub mu, I'm actually already writing C sub mu and C indicates convolution operator. So we are very close to understand what convolution is. But first, it's a kind of asymmetric thing. We're convolving a measure, a functional, with a function, which is a signal. So we are not convolving measures at the moment, but it's uh, functionals paired with uh, signals. And this is done in a bilinear way. That means if somebody says, okay, I want to apply T mu on a linear combination, three F1 plus five F2, then you can do it individually. But also if you say, no, I want to convolve with a linear combination, let's say with a finite discrete measure, you will say, well, then of course, you are doing the individual convolution operators, which we have in the scene or we expect to be translation operators, and therefore we are coming up with a sum of shifted operators. So let's watch at this equation number 42 at the for a little moment, which says, if um, you are having a functional, you can produce an operator, which is called T sub mu. I call it the convolution operator by the measure mu or the system, the channel, introduced with the impulse response mu on the signal f. This is a continuous function which has values at the point zero. And these values can, the connection between the operator and the measure is just take the function f, apply it to the flipped version, then shift the flipped version, and then apply the mu. In the opposite direction we have, you're giving me a signal, pardon, you're giving me a channel, an operator, and I want to find out what might be, what is a way to get the impulse response without this nasty testing with rectangular functions, taking limits and inserting the Dirac. I'm saying, no, no, I'm looking for a functional. So I only have to tell you what the output is of that linear functional, the measure now, because we're working with C0, coming, arising from the system T, which maps C0 into C0 and the mu sub T on the value f is supposed to be just the value at zero of the output of the channel whenever the input is the function that we look on the left hand side but flipped so f check is the flip operator it's just f um, uh, flipped around and with negative
Now the flip is a little bit kind of slightly disturbing. And if you don't uh, listen to the talk here um, and look only at the script, you may say, why is he doing the flip or so? That makes things a little bit more cumbersome. Actually, I think that explaining the moving average concept uh, first is uh, helping to understand why we do the flip because we have seen in the correspondence that we had for polynomials, these cubic polynomials, uh, the delta at point five was a shift to minus five, by minus five. And it's exactly this uh, kind of change of sign that we try to avoid or that we can avoid by introducing more or less the same idea. Uh, so it's the same correspondence, except there's a flip in one direction. And of course, the same flip has to occur in the opposite direction. So let us try to, to see that how we can uh, establish this correspondence. I think I will try to, I will be able to explain this connection by listing all the relevant properties. Uh, if you discover something important that I have not done, uh, please let me know or, or look up in the script or so, but I try to split it into two parts. One is to outline what has to be verified and I will go through the technical details only for those parts which are really more interesting, which you're not easily um, believing from, for example, or which you cannot do it by yourself in one or two lines. Okay, so I'm starting now with an explanation and saying, well, take the first formula. It's, you can take as a definition. How can you define, I call it a convolution operator or a system induced by the linear functional mu or the measure mu? And it's by this formula. But is this a linear operator? Is this a translation invariant operator? How big is the norm of each of these things? We plan to establish an isometry. We can measure functionals by the functional norm. We can measure operators by the operator norm. That's also why I introduced these operator norms. Uh, and we will verify that this correspondence is a uh, one-to-one -one correspondence. So for each measure, there is a system which corresponds to it. For each system, there's a measure, that's the second formula, and they have the same size in their natural norm. Okay, so the first thing is, well, is it a linear operator? Yeah, that's quite clear. Is it bounded? Well, let's try to see uh, if we can control the operator norm, and if I make a triple bar with a subscript, it means as an operator from C0 to C0. Later on, we will look at convolution operators acting on L1, L2, other spaces. So that's why here I put the C0. The claim is, well, uh, if it's induced by a bounded measure, which is a functional, we can measure it as a functional, and we will do this control. Now, in the key part of the estimate for the proof of the translation invariance, I will use a very simple formula that you should maybe try yourself by writing out one line of, of text. Is, it's just a good exercise to understand how these symbols are working. So I try to make everything explicit by using operators instead of just writing, writing a lot of integrals, changing variables and coming out with magic results. But I'm telling you, the key of the check operator, how is it compatible with the shift operator? And so it's shifted operator of F, flipped is the same as the flipped function shifted in the opposite direction. Just think of a, maybe a bump function sitting at zero and you shift it to the right by five. Clearly it's sitting at near five. If you flip it, it's sitting at minus five. Of course, the shape is the shape of the flipped function and the minus is exactly the minus set. So intuitively, this is obvious. And if you write it out by saying, well, what does it mean T set F check at a given argument Y? You're just reformulating it and you're done. So now one of the main points uh, is, is a system that, or a linear operator which maps, which is into, induced by such a linear functional, uh, we will have several questions. Is it commute, is an operator commuting with translation? And also, will it map C0 into C0? 
I mean, we could have something which maps uh, um, every function into, I don't know, constant times its maximal value. Well, that wouldn't be linear, but it would be uh, going to constant functions, so not vanishing at infinity, but clearly it would be translation invariant. So it's not completely obvious. So let's first look and discuss in great detail uh, the relationship and see how we can juggle with these symbols. So what we have to do is to verify that if you apply the shift operator to the input, and then you apply the system as our recipe is saying it, this will be the same and look at the end as first applying the system or the linear operation coming from the beginning and then doing the shift operator. So it's a pointwise operator and we have to say, well, what does it mean to take the, the, the system at a point y? We have to take the signal the, upon the functional mu and apply it to the input signal, but this input has to be shifted and flipped, upon, has to be flipped first. Yeah, well, it just be shifted by y, ty. And then you have to take the flipped version of t set of f. But this is the formula above. It's the same as t minus set f flipped. But now the argument of our linear functional is just take the flipped version of f, shift to the left with set and then apply y and by the composition of shift operators, that's clearly a t of y minus set of f flipped. Now you can say, okay, y minus set is just one possible argument. So this is the output signal, but not at a position y, but the argument of the shift is y minus set. But what is this? This is the shifted version, the T set shift of the function, which has the name T mu of F at Y. And if you see that this is true for every argument Y, the square brackets are equal. So T mu of T set of F is the same as T set applied to T mu of F for every input signal. But that's exactly what equality of operators is the concatenation left hand side of first t set and then on upon it applied t mu is the same as the same operators in opposite order. And this was true for every set. So we have this commutation relation. And yes, this is a translation linear, translation, lin, in, translation invariant operation. Now, um, maybe I have not spelled out the details that you can control the boundedness very easily and actually control uh, that the size of the output is easily controlled by the size of the functional. Maybe it comes later, but just look here at the first definition. Mu is applied to a shifted version of the flipped F. If you're asking me how is, what is the maximum norm, then I would argue flip operator doesn't shift, uh, uh, change the sup norm ty doesn't shift the operator. So this input has the same size as the original f and the functional applied to some function of a given size is okay. So this is really a very easy part. What is much less easy is the verification that the output, if you put in as a input signal, a function in C0 will be uh, actually in C0. And the first step is to verify that it's uniformly continuous. So I recall C0, the space of functions vanishing infinity, they are mostly up to some small tail concentrated on compact sets. And there is this theorem in the analysis that a function living on a compact domain, which is co uh, continuous, has to be uniformly continuous. And this property is preserved by taking limits of compactly supported elements. So every function f in C0 is uniformly continuous. And we had the characterization of uniform continuity. We were showing functions are uniformly continuous if and only if uh, they are deviating from their shifted version only as little as we want, if only the argument is small. So if we are claiming that the output preserves this uniform continuity, we have to look at the output signal t mu of f and compare it with the shifted version. So we have tx t mu of f minus t mu of f measured in the supnorm. 
but by definition, no, but by the previous consideration, we can change the order and suddenly we have T mu of TXF. So we can pull out the T mu and say apply T mu to a C0 function, which is our uniformly bounded continuous function, which is TXF minus F. And now, of course, the T mu is an operator, and therefore you pull out the operator norm, which we control by the size of the measure actually. And the rest is something which goes to zero because we have an input which is uniformly continuous. Okay, so we know now that the output will be uniformly continuous, but still we have to verify that it's compact, uh, that it's decaying at infinity. And here um, you can probably do different arguments. So in, with a measure theoretic approach, you would argue I'm writing the convolution operator as an integral. And we use the fact that the bounded measure is mostly concentrated on a compact set. So that, that would be uh, the natural idea, but we can transfer this idea to our setting. And again, these bupus, these partitions of unity are quite useful. So I will argue in two steps and concentrate especially on the first step. And that will be, well, let's first assume that instead of having such a representation that mu is a sum over all the mu psi's, we've seen you can do it with full index set. The sum of the pieces, each of them measured in the measure space, this is an absolutely convergent sum, but we assume now that you're happy with finitely many of them. This condition actually is equivalent to say the support of the measure is compact. We have not defined the support of a measure, that's why I'm making this description a little bit um, indirect. The same thing is we're taking um, a function f and it's equivalent, the assumption is equivalent to assume that f is compact support. So I would say, well, f always can be written as the sum of all the f times psi j. j is the same partition of units if you want, but to separate it, I put a different finite set here. If it's compact supported, then uh, only finitely many of these terms are non-zero, and that's what I have in mind. So let's see what we can do. If we look now at the measure, now the, the, the operator induced by such a measure on a function which is also concentrated. Now, uh, the argument that I will use is, or technical argument at the end of this next step will be that I'm saying, well, there is only a finite sum and another finite sum. And so all these pieces are concentrated somewhere. So somehow uh, it's a smeared version of the observation that delta of x convolved with delta of y is delta of x plus y. So if you have a bump function, it's concentrated, I don't know, on the interval four to five. And another one which is concentrated on, on the interval 10 to 11, then we know from continuous functions and from writing integrals that we expect the convolution product to be concentrated on the sum of the left boundaries, which was four plus 10, so 14. And the upper limit would be five plus 11, which is, 16. So I expect the convolution product to be like smeared versions of deltas and that's what we do. Now um, I need a rough version only and therefore I'm saying, well, if you're giving me any finite set of psi's, and each of these psi's are living somewhere, then we have finitely many bump functions and they must live in some ball of radius r. Think of the plane, put them at different lattice points and then you have some radius that includes all of them in, in one, or you have a 3D volume where you have all of them. Now, even if E and F are different or so, you can choose a radius for E, another for F, and therefore you choose a maximum of those radii, and you can say, we can be sure that all the elements Psi I or Psi J, which appear in our discussion, uh, have the, no, uh, have the property that they will be zero outside of, of uh, if the argument is, is far away. So maybe the psi with number 10 is living at the boundary of our domain, but 
it's if you go outside of this ball of radius r, everything will be zero. And we will use this now for the next step. Now, uh, you can imagine that we are about to control t sub mu of f. But this is a finite sum over a finite sum. So overall, it's a finite double sum. So therefore, it will be enough to verify that uh, this is concentrated in some uh, bounded domain. If we only take the index indices i from f and j from, it should be e here, then it has to be corrected. Now, I think I have to go slowly through the next step because that's one of the crucial steps. But it's more or less a good exercise in what are we doing? We're saying, and that's how to read these symbols, and they're really a shorthand notation, which means a very compressed way to express facts that otherwise would need, I don't know, half pages of integrals, and we are doing this now exactly concentrating on what we're doing from going from one step to another and by trying to explain it i hope that it's not abstract in the bad sense but abstract in the sense really focusing on what we're doing so what we have to look for is we look at the output of one of these pieces of mu i call it mu psi so the system induced by the functional mu multiplied with psi i whenever we apply it to one of the billing blocks of our function f, which is f times psi j. And what we want to show is that if y, the argument y, is far away from the region, more precisely if y, absolute value, is bigger than 2r, we can expect to get zero. Now, what is a measure, upon what is the, the system arising from uh, from a signal, it's just from, from a functional. It's this functional, which we have called mu times psi i. We have learned that you can multiply functionals with original functions. But then you have to take the input signal, which is psi j times f, actually, maybe more, but um, yeah, uh, well, I think on purpose, I was changing the order. Psi j with f is the same as f with psi j, but yeah, to continue, it's better to use it in this order. Take that one, flip it, and then shift it, and see what happens. So the next step is, well, what is it? Mu psi applied to anything in square brackets is the same as mu times psi i, what we have in those brackets. The other thing is, if you shift a product function, ty of psi jf, um, you have to, you have to, yeah, actually, uh, I think there is something, you yeah, have to do a correction. I should tell you that, of course, the procedure means psi j f and then flipped. So I should write psi j flipped. And then you are applying a translation operator to the product of two flipped functions. And that, then we use the formula we had before. It means you're shifting in the opposite direction. And yeah, okay, so there are two errors. I was doing this very quickly before the course. So we should write t minus y psi j check. So because check also has to be flipped. And then I have to write t minus y f flipped. Now t minus, I see, okay, I will, I will correct it. The main point now is that we uh, pull out the f check. So whatever the f is, actually, it's only the location where the psi i and the psi j are that which matters for the rest, because what we get is up to some check, which I try to ignore for a little moment. We have a product of psi i with a shifted psi j. Now, because of the concentration of this, psi, if psi j is concentrated on a ball of radius r, and you remove it uh, by something which is larger than 2r. So just think of a circle in the plane, which has a radius r, and then you move it away by more than 2r. And it's clear that the new circle will not intersect with the original one. So the key argument is, yeah, the flip doesn't matter because even if I have cj flipped, 
it's also living in the same circle. So therefore not, not too much is happening with my sloppiness at this point. So we can argue that whenever these indices are in the original finite sets, therefore concentrated on a ball of radius r in the original position, after shifting them by so much, the product of those two localizing functions will be zero. And zero times f check will be zero, even if you have a shifted version of f check. Therefore, mu is applied to the zero functional, and therefore the resulting product is zero. This is true for every i in the finite set f. This is true for every j in the finite set e. Therefore, the whole sum, which is t mu of f, will be zero at every point y, which is further away from the region than 2r under this given situation. Okay, so we have seen that t mu of f under the additional condition is having a compact support. It is zero outside some big ball and it's uniformly continuous. Therefore, it's of course a continuous function with compact support and therefore it's in C zero. Now, the second argument is also a kind of a generic thing that you will say the rest is just approximation. So, uh, It's usually I'm saying it's the same formal heuristic argument as asking how can I compute pi squared? Well, you approximate pi by decimal expressions which are finite and then you multiply them out and then you're taking limits of those products. In our case, we're approximating the measure by a finite sum and we have seen because of the absolute convergent of the sum which is above here, this difference will be go to zero, so the tails will be smaller and smaller. And uh, this second statement is a little bit, uh, yeah, it's, I would say from the point of view of analysis, it's quite clear, but from the point of view of writing down the technical details, it might be not so easy, not so difficult. Yeah, it requires a little bit of thinking, but also the partial sums of these things will go to zero. For me, the best way of looking at this is maybe I should have added it here. It's this, this expression, the sum of the pieces f psi j is the same as f multiplied with the partial sum of psi j. And you have to remember that the psi j are pointwise adding up to constant one. So if you're saying, well, I would like to make the sum of those psi j constant one at all those places where the function f is big and the rest doesn't matter. So you're trying to create a plateau function. I will also show you some MATLAB plot from this later on maybe. Then you would just take all the elements from the partition of unity in the area where it's interesting. So I don't know, you could say in the real line, uh, instead of index set, set you're summing from minus 100 to plus 100. And then roughly speaking, you will get a plateau function maybe from minus 99 to plus 99, uh, but this is a finite sum and therefore the elements where this is true are, are limits. And then you're using the argument that uh, we have the completeness. Okay, there's a typo. So we have these local, localized measures mu n, which are appearing by taking only finite sums of these measures. And you're taking functions fn which are Cauchy sequences in the space of C zero. And then what you have to prove, and I'm not doing this here uh, at the moment, at least, you have to show that uh, this product of the two Cauchy sequences, the different norms, because of the estimate, you control the output by the size of the measure times the size of the function, you will get a Cauchy sequence in this. So maybe, uh, your how to get from these finite sets to a sequence. Well, just take uh, all the elements in the partition of unity, which are have anything to do with balls of radius n. So you're creating more or less plateau functions. And then uh, you're doing the same thing for the measure and the function for individual function. And then this will be a sequence and then you verify this sequence is a Cauchy sequence. So this should be Cauchy sequence. And therefore, uh, 
we, we can invoke the completeness of C0. If somebody is giving a Cauchy sequence, it will have a limit. Now guess what the limit is. We know that uh, T mu F is well defined because mu is a measure, F is a function in C0. And clearly um, the convergence of those partial sums to the measure mu and the convergence of the localized versions of F n to, to the function F in C0 guarantees that the limit is T mu of F is something which belongs as a limit of goods or guys in C0 belongs to C0. So in this way, we have verified that we have this decay condition. And uh, I will just maybe try to indicate some further statement to you. And that's this assignment of systems, translation linear, translation invariant linear systems to measures and measures to systems are inverse to each other. I don't write it explicitly here, it's in the script. Uh, but this is more or less just reading the original statement uh, from the beginning um, forward and backward or so. Yeah, what we can also do, and I was making the claim that you can control the system induced by a measure, or you can say the convolution operator with a bounded measure is well-defined as we have seen right now and uh, by the size of the measure, and now I'm doing the opposite. I'm saying, well, how can I control the functional induced by a system? So I'm using the second formula now to say, well, the size of a functional is obtained by applying this to functions f, which have maximum norm at most one. So what is the functional by the rule? I will say, okay, I take the input as the signal f, so I flip it, then I make T of F flipped and then I evaluate at zero. So it's obvious that this value at zero, we have a continuous function, uh, is at most the supnorm. And the supnorm by definition of the operator norm is the operator norm of the operator, so to say the size of the operator, the best estimate for the magnification of the input signal size by the input signal size but the input is a flipped version now uh, which has the same size as of course as the f and that was if you take the soup over all elements in the unit ball that's one so we can verify that mu of t the measure coming from the system is at most having the size of the t and now uh, maybe i can should oh yeah so maybe yeah here is the argument that should be put earlier on. Here I'm checking what is the system induced by the measure? Well, the absolute value of this is at most, the absolute value here, this is missing, but that absolute value is, is controlled by the size of the functional times the size of this flip shifted version, which I said already is the F. So we have, if you jump to the next line, the size of the measure T mu is at most the measure mu. Now, if you combine the two estimates, the control of the functional by the system, and then now the control of the system by the functional, and combine it with the observation that they're inverse to each other, then they have to have exactly the same size. Just imagine that you would have a strict inequality in one direction, then you would go back, you would show that the size of some object, let's say the linear functional, the measure, is strictly less than the size of the measure, but it's non-zero, so it, that's, I mean, even if it's zero, zero is not strictly less than zero. So it has to be equal already, just because two operations are both non-expansive and uh, they are inverse to each other, so therefore we have this. So we have a very nice situation that now we can identify in a one-to-one -one fashion the linear functionals, which we call measures, by the functional norm, by the operator norm of the corresponding system. And we only have to understand now better how these things work. And uh, I think uh, that's a good point to stop now and take a short break. I would say, uh, Maybe we start uh, in uh, 10 at, at 15, 10, so six minutes from now. Thank you very much.
And uh, if you have comments, please put it in the chat. Otherwise, I also take a short break. So I'm continuing now our session. And uh, the key point of uh, what we have understood so far is we have to understand linear functionals in order to understand operators. And we will see very soon, I mean next week, that uh, there is something like the free transform which helps us to diagonalize it. But we would like to do convolution on those linear functionals and we would like to take free transform of those linear functionals. And of course, convolution has to do a lot with composition of systems. And as it is with the, with the systems that we have for cubic polynomials, uh, associativity of composition is quite clear, um, but commutativity is not so clear. I had to look up myself whether it's true or not, and I have a proof now, but i leave it to you. How can you prove that if you have four different translation operators, um, can you write every other every every other system on the cubic polynomials uh, as a linear combination. So it's a question about whether such matrices are linear independent, because if in the cubic polynomial case, we're working with a four dimensional space, the dual space also has to be four dimensional, even if we have many concrete shapes and the realizations of those operators with shift operators, first order, second order derivatives and so on. So we get a huge number of in appearance, a huge number of linear functionals, which at first sight don't look as row vectors, but of course as functionals, we can describe them as row vectors acting on the column vectors containing the coefficients. So that space of operators must be of the same dimension as the space of linear functionals, therefore it must be four dimensional. So it's only a question of, if somebody is taking four different translation operators, can you verify it that this, uh, these are linear independent because then you can argue, then every other one in this four dimensional space has to be written as a thing, as a linear combination. Now, this is a typical argument in finite dimensions, you are just taking the right number of linear independent elements and you know everything can be represented. And then of course the question is how can you compute it? So if anybody wants to think about this problem or provide a partial solution, I have one answer in, in that direction already from one of you, but that I think is worthwhile and helps you to understand things much better. I don't want to go into this at the beginning of this second part, but I would like to indicate uh, that we will try to do something similar in the continuous case, but there we cannot use the representation of, um, of a given system as a linear combination of discrete systems or translation operators, because we have already seen that the closure of the discrete measures, the finite discrete measures, are just the infinite uh, discrete measures with finite sum of coefficients in the terms of absolute sum of the coefficients. And clearly this does not allow us to represent uh, one of these nice measures which have density k of x. That's why we have to do something more delicate and I think that will require again some functional analysis. Therefore, at least for the beginning of this session, I would like to tell you some story and connect what we have been doing so far with what you can find in the engineering books. So probably you have seen pictures like the graph of figure five already in the script uh, in your course on signal and uh, signal uh, systems and signals and system representation. It's the standard way of saying, well, assume you have a smooth function. And in my case, I'm using a complex valued function with green graph for maybe the imaginary part and blue part is the real part. We approximate each of them by rectangular functions. And the typical argument of system representation goes like this. Okay, the system is, X, uh, is uh, com um, compatible with translations. So if we know what the output is of a rectangular pulse at any position in this lattice, we, we know what the output is uh, of a rescaled pulse at a different position. 
And then we let uh, those pulses go to infinite size, but uh, still with integral one. And we call this limit the Dirac delta. And we, we claim that we just have to take the output of the Dirac delta, and that will be uh, exactly the right thing. And you have to convolve the input signal with this. Now I have a number of concerns about this standard strategy because it makes use of an object which is looks like a function which is plus infinity but so strong that the integral is one. Why is it not three or five? Or if I multiply plus infinity by three, why is it still? Why is it different or so? So I think it's it's quite uh, difficult. What we will do, we will see. We are talking about functionals, and these functionals have a limit, and uh, we have to describe limits in the right way, and then, then we have a clear uh, picture of this. But on the other hand, I think uh, it's not completely uh, wrong, except that, for example, if we are having a system as we are considering it now, uh, we might not even be allowed to produce an exact uh, input, which is a step function. Because you know, I was saying, we look at systems which allow C0 as input and are not discontinuous functions. The second thing is, of course, how do we do the approximation or so? So if you would say, is the approximation meant in the supernorm sense, uh, then of course the signal would have to be uniformly continuous, then step functions or other functions would be convergence or so. So I think the approach uh, coming along with such pictures in the classical books of signal processing have at least some weakness. Now, what is a step function or how would I choose a step function? Well, I took essentially, I think if I see it correctly, if you look at the graphs, I think I took just the value of my continuous input signal at the midpoint. So it I think I'm not completely sure, I don't remember anymore, but if you look at the graphs, it seems that the horizontal bars are always uh, passing through the midpoint of the interval, so they are at the height of the midpoint. So that's something which is quite typical for Riemannian sums. So you might say, okay, what he's showing us is just a Riemannian, the way how he's doing a Riemannian sum is dividing the graph of the function in the horizontal axis, so in the time axis, into equal pieces. You can think that I'm zooming in very much to make the pieces visible. And then I'm saying a Riemannian sum is the value of the function at a specific point in the interval. And I think here it was just xi number five would be the midpoint of the fifth interval in some enumeration. And then we multiply by the length of the interval, but that's exactly the rule of the area of a rectangle. It's the height of the rectangle times the length of the basis. So I would say, if we determine the area that's coming from the graph by separating real and imaginary part, then a Riemannian sum is exactly the integral of an of a approximating step function. And somehow you would say, well, if we take limits, we make everything finer and finer and finer. Due to the uniform continuity, we're getting the Riemann integral. So assume you have such a function which is uniformly continuous and maybe compactly support, because it's compactly supported, then it will be Riemann integrable and we're approximating it. Now, uh, what kind of uh, properties does this collection of rectangular function have? If you normalize them, they are just adding up to one. So maybe you're saying, I'm taking step with one over 10, and then the rectangular pulses may live on zero to one over 10, one over 10 to two over 10, and so on. So the marking on this axis would be just, just some, some step width. Now, if I find that this uh, idea of splitting a function into pieces, describing the local behavior, is not appropriate because we are destroying continuity, I would take the next easy part instead of piecewise constant, which means I'm taking polynomials which are glued together in a way which is not even continuous. And the next step we take a bupu consisting of triangular functions. So my 
suggestion for modification and making the argument uh, that you have in engineering books more more realistic or more mathematically solid would be simply and now i'm just doing maybe the real part i would say take the original function take as a partition of unity what i call this spline approximation so it's, this is now the s peep psi of the same f or the real part of f with the system of triangular function and as we have seen or as i tried to explain earlier the resulting function it's hard to distinguish or if you I think maybe i took a smoother version or so but this is something which is now clearly uh yeah so i think it's this is not not the piecewise linear, but maybe cubic or quadratic function. So I'm getting some continuous function. Maybe I, I should also show you at some point the piecewise linear interpolation, which is just what MATLAB would do. And uh, in order to see that there's a sum of amplitudes coming from sampling multiplied with these uh, part elements of the partition of unity, which hopefully are very well localized. I was plotting all the scaled versions of these pieces of the partition of unity in the right way. So here, where it's negative, I have a contribution which is concentrated here, and there at the positive part is going up. Yeah, so it's not piecewise linear, but maybe cubic polynomials, but at a relatively fine lattice, not too fine because otherwise you wouldn't see the difference anymore, but fine enough so that you see already here with this relatively coarse partition of unity, um, this quasi interpolation operator, because for cubic polynomials is not interpolating anymore, you have a good approximation. Uh, maybe a side remark, if you would have a function which is smooth and you would like to do numerical integration, then one way to understand the numerical integration rules is exactly this, you are approximating this but maybe instead of the simple quasi-interpolation, uh, where you just take the amplitude from the point which is living at the, the midpoint maybe of, of this partition of unity element, but you would try to fit the curve, so you would fit a quadratic polynomial to let's say four sampling values, and then you proceed and then you integrate these cubic polynomials piecewise and so on, which is not done by taking Riemann and sums, but just the high school rule of integrating the integral of x to the fifth is x to the sixth divided by six, because this is how you undo the differentiation operator. Differentiation of x, x to the sixth power is of course six times x to the fifth power. Okay, so uh, we have already discussed earlier on uh, last time that this spline approximation operator f is, uh, on the one hand, non-expansive. So the maximal value of this new function is at most the maximal value of this. Maybe this is a good example to explain it here. Assume, which maybe is not true, but yeah, maybe you can take a look here. The uh, zoom in, assume the maximal value here is at the red tip or so, but the maximum of the blue is a little bit less or assume it would be at the negative side. The red curve is the original one, the blue is the approximating. So uh, the example is uh, telling you it might be a little bit smaller, but uh, if you do it in details, uh, you can show that uh, the, uh, the approximation uh, operator, the S P psi operator is non-expansive. So this is one of the things I wanted to tell you. Uh, and uh, the second part uh, I have to go through is, I think it's page 35, is yeah, now summarizing the theorem from before. The linear translation invariant system, I also sometimes call it TILS, translation invariant linear systems on C0 are identified by those uh, rules and come back to the notation that I'm using in the script. What was called T mu in the extra script, the operator, the matrix, uh, the, yeah, the operator coming from the linear functional is now already called the convolution operator. And uh, the convolution operator produced from the measure, and this is the measure in, uh, obtained from the system. So, and uh, you have seen there are isometric and so on. 
Now, uh, maybe without going through looking uh, for the corresponding paragraphs in the script, I would like to remind you, we have seen in the polynomial case that a delta is the most simple linear functional. This corresponds to shift. And I think you will trust me if I tell you by introducing this extra flip, we have this extra property that we are, uh, we are getting a, a translation by plus five if we use the Dirac at plus five. Of course, um, secretly I was switching from one dimensional to multidimensional. So you can think of everything now doing by image processing. So uh, optical people would call the impulse response uh, in this, uh, the point spread function. So the point spread function is again, the measure which is describing the translation invariant linear operator. So if you have a blurring effect on your image and it's constant, so the blurring is the same at every place, uh, then it's just uh, this rule number 67 is practically realized by the way, I mean, I want to understand the blurring that my camera is having. Uh, or that uh, is occurring in the movie because I was taking pictures out of the train while it is moving or so. And because the train is moving in one direction, we know it's a smearing in a one dimensional direction or so. Then how can you get information about the measure mu? Well, the answer is just look at, uh, the, the, uh, at this uh, behavior at zero. And so, the impulse response, uh, which you have in, in the audio case by knocking more or less, would be now you have a little star or a little light source and you sh show it through the optics and then you would have some response and that's actually just the measure. At the moment, uh, this is not clear why it's like this, but uh, the rule that we can get or what, what is the benefit of having this uh, uh, identification or so that we can transfer structure from one to the other. So I don't go back to the extra notes but there I was writing down a little bit that uh, the isometric identification means whatever you're doing if you take linear combinations there are linear combinations on the other side. So if you're asking me, are translation operators or, or general linear systems linear independent? Can you express one of them as a linear combination of the others? You can transfer everything to the measure. Uh, if somebody is giving you a measure, you know how to do a system. If you have a system, you know how to do a measure. Now, a priori, those measures don't have a multiplicative structure. That's like, well, if I store in linear algebra all the information about the linear mapping by just storing column-wise the images under the linear mapping of the unit vectors and I get the rectangular scheme. I mean, how can I play around with the rectangular scheme? We all have learned how to multiply two matrices if their sizes match and it's called matrix multiplication. But as I keep telling you, this is not just a funny game, it's just the only way to compose those rectangular schemes in a reasonable way such that the um, uh, composition of linear operators is compatible with the composition of matrices by this algebraic trick. So essentially we're saying MATLAB is allowing to do efficiently combination and upon iteration compo composition of linear uh, operators once we have a description in terms of matrices. In particular, if somebody is giving us an invertible linear mapping, we know that the inverse of the mapping must be the inverse of the matrix. The inverse mapping is described by the properties of undoing what we're doing, whereas the inverse matrix is uh, just a per particular manipulation which you can do, I don't know, with Gauss elimination or whatever. I mean, you all know the trick, the inverse matrix can be obtained by writing um, the unit matrix on the, to the right of a square matrix, then applying Gauss elimination and suddenly the inverse matrix pops up uh, the outcome on the right hand side, whereas 
On the left hand side, you are having transformed it to unit matrix. So these are technical algorithmic things which allow you to actually perform the inversion. For us, for the signal processing case, of course, we will see that we are, can turn such a convolution operator into a multiplication operator. And then it's quite clear that the inversion only is possible if there are no zeros, because nobody can undo things which are kind of killing certain frequency bands. Uh, and uh, so this is why frequency one will be quite crucial or so. Okay, so uh, I told you already, we have to be careful with the measures. And uh, yeah, this is just another way of, of writing uh, the things that I have explained in the previous course. And uh, as a next step, and it's more or less uh, just the repetition of the polynomial case, I'm just telling you, we can define uh, a convolution of two measures. And I think that's the only and, and really natural way of doing it um, by saying we, we take uh, the two systems, we compose them, two systems induced by mu one and mu two. So in this case, mu two, the convolution by mu two would be the first system and then follows upon it the convolution by mu one. And clearly the, uh, the composition of two linear operators is a linear operator. The composition of two bounded linear operators is a bounded linear operator. The composition of two operators which commute with translation preserve this property. Therefore, there must be some element which has this property. I mean, if you're asking, for example, for distribution, uh, distribution uh, law, distributive law, sorry, then you may ask what if you replace mu two by three times mu three plus five times mu four. And then of course you have the corresponding distributive law for the convolution symbol or so. But at the moment we do not know yet whether these uh, convolutions will be commutative. So whether the order matters, if I would show you these operators as black box, it would be just placing one in front of the other and then changing the order. And you all know general linear operators do not commute. Matrix multiplication is not at all commutative. So why is this smaller algebra a commutative algebra? In the polynomial case, the argument was, well, everything is coming up as can be written as linear combinations of finite discrete convolution operators, which are translation operators. Translation operators also are here. They're okay. Even infinite sums are okay. That might be a good exercise. So if you have two convolutions by two discrete measures, infinite sums of discrete measures with amplitudes which add up in an absolutely convergent way, how can you prove that they are commuting? And uh, you very soon will come back to the situation, okay, if it's a delta x convolved with delta y, it will be delta of x plus y, but delta of x plus y is also delta of y plus x, so the order can be turned around to the opposite to, uh, order. If you do finite linear combinations, the same is obvious, you just write it out. And then you have to take limits. So essentially, we're taking limits um, of, of finite discrete measurements, which are finite linear combination of translation operators and translation operators commute as many as, as you want. But, and that's the difference to the finite dimensional case, you're not getting all the systems in this way. And that's why we have to do some step with discretization, which I will not do uh, here. Okay, yeah, here maybe, uh, that 79 is a good, um, good example of why it's still true now with the flip that the delta corresponds to shift operator. Okay, I forgot to, to have, that I have it here. So what is the convolution with the Dirac measure at F? Uh, uh, on, on F, and of course this will be a function which has arguments at any position set. So uh, in this way you're getting away from the fixing the symbols, it's just, a convolution operator to an input signal is a new function which has value at set. And the rule is take set, the argument, as a shift operator, but apply it to the 
flipped version. So I have P set of F check. This is how you have to read this here. The check operator is binding more properly. Or you could say it's T of minus set of, well, but T of um, minus set F and the whole thing flipped, but we don't need. Okay, so it's the delta X of T set of F flipped. Now what is delta X apl applied to any signal? It's the value at X of this function. Now you have to recall, what is the name of this function? It's a shifted version of F flipped. So how do you do it? And that's exactly one of the things, if you see it, it's very plausible, but try to uh, not close your eyes, but uh, try to do it after the course or next week after two days or so to prove this formula yourself. Once you're uh, familiar enough with the symbols, you find it very convenient. And, but at the very beginning, you might think, okay, now I have to, I don't know, do something. And you might read it in a bad way. I have introduced in now a little bit more brackets than absolutely necessary to avoid confusion, but uh, still there might be not enough of them. So we have the value of this function. Now what is, the, whatever the function is here, it's the called f check. At, uh, in a shifted version means you write f check, say dot minus set and the argument is x. So you have f check of x minus set. But this is by flipping the argument f of set minus x. Well, we almost forgot that this has to be viewed as a function of set. So it's f of dot minus x, which is the sh x shifted version of f at set. Now we can throw away the set and say, okay, this means that the convolution operator by the delta x at f is the same function as the shifted version. And that means, of course, because applied to any function f in C0, you have the same action, but this convolution operator is the same as a shift operator. Now, of course, by specializing, I'm saying, now the mysterious sifting properties is popping up again. We learn that convolution operator by the Dirac at zero is the shift operator by zero. Now, if somebody tells you by shifting by zero, I have identity, that's not the great news, but you can write it now if you use this star symbol, f is the same as Dirac at zero convolved with f. Or more generally, if you write convolution with Dirac, tx of f is the same as Dirac of f. So this is more or less uh, the, the famous sifting property, but I told you already, for me it's nothing else that if somebody is asking you what happens if you apply the identity operator to the function f, and then you ask what is the value at x, or maybe at the variable argument set, then you have to pick the value at set, but how do you pick at set? Well, you move your delta to the position set. So this is the delta Dirac symbol at x minus set, that's how you write it, and applying it is written as an integral. And so this is really what you're doing. Now, uh, I hope uh, <clears throat> that this is clear, and, and I would like to explain a little bit more to you more at the, at the level of storytelling without going into too many details. We have already enough theory today um, about uh, uh, continuous integrals. So very often people are teaching uh, the integral of uh, the convolution of two functions through an integral, and this convolution is then shown to satisfy the convolution theorem. So. Uh, that's actually how I learned uh, the convolution. So my advisor, Hans Reiter, told us in the course, you know, convolution is an important thing. We didn't know that it has to do with engineering and signal processing, uh, but it was taken as a mathematically challenging subject to understand convolution, which was, I, can, I found it a funny and interesting uh, kind of multiplication. And then we were learning that you can do it and diagonalize it to the free transform. Now, the way how Brad Osgood in his uh, course is in, in Stanford is doing it, he was saying, well, I introduced the Fourier transform just because we know, you know, engineers know that it's important. So we have to teach a course on Fourier analysis. Then he asked, well, what happens if I multiply two Fourier transforms? And then he's refabricating the formula for convolution. Well, I think uh, 
the most natural way is to say, well, if somebody is giving me a real moving average, so maybe the g of x is a nice Riemann integrable function. It could be the box function, which for me is the indicator function, which is, is described by a box. And if I do the box in a symmetric way, you would see the graph of a rectangular function starting at minus one half, going to plus one half, height one, so the area is one, and you would say, well, <clears throat> I'm using this as a measure. And then of course the system which is arising from this is at each point recomputing, replacing the function by the local average from x minus over at the point x, the moving average would be just the average from x minus one half to x plus one half. Well, if you do this, you might say, okay, this function is oscillating too much. I'm smoothing out too much. I would like to do a smoothing over smaller domains. And then it's very natural to say, maybe I take an interval of length, I don't know, uh, point 0.2, uh, which means I take a symmetric interval uh, from minus one over 10 to plus one over 10. And because the length is one over five, I would multiply everything by five. So I would divide by the, through the length of the interval. But you can also say, no, I'm taking the G, a compressed version of the box function. I compress it from length one, I'm going to length five, so it's smaller now. And uh, um, then of course you compensate it and you have a less smeared version. So this is something which we get from these other nice linear functionals. So I also would like to recall to you that if you start with a continuous function g of x, which is continuous and compactly supported. If you apply it to a C0 function, the product is another function which is compactly supported and continuous. Therefore, you can take the good old Riemann integral, an iterated integral over x1, x2 until xd, last coordinate, and you write it in this way and you get a linear functional and by the same rule, you're getting a linear system or so. So you take a moving average, and then you're doing another moving averages of the human, of the of this moving average. And then you can find out, well, there was a G1 and a G2, and maybe the same. What is the output? Is this also, can this also be written now as a moving average? And this is what you would do now, and uh, I'll leave it out first as an exercise. I think I will do it later on to tell you, well, what you have to do is to take the classical convolution result uh, for functions, uh, and then you will have exactly this way. So the convolution for continuous functions with compact support, or even Lebesgue integrable function is just compatible, the only compatible way of defining the convolution of functions, but in the spirit of identifying mu of g, the measure, the linear functional induced by the density with the function itself. So uh, this embedding is really a very nice harmless em or embedding. Uh, and we have seen that if you take the L1 norm of the g here, it's exactly the functional norm of the measure. I was not giving you the complete abstract uh, approach, but I was explaining to you how you can do it uh, by choosing F appropriately, and I don't have to repeat it here. So uh, in a way, it's like embedding the rationals into the real numbers. We know that we can multiply rational numbers, and it's very easy, A1 divided by B1 multiplied with A2 divided by B2 is just a1 times A2 divided by the product of the denominators. Now we have something similar here. We have the ordinary functions, but now I would say we have a composition of measures, which is this abstract convolution, and we can check whether it's also possible to come back. Well, this is like saying, if I'm multiplying two periodic um, decimals, can I get a periodic decimal in the decimal system? And the answer is yes. And you can compute it also and show how to compute the multiplication in the rational case. So it's a bit strange to explain this way, but this is how I would do it nowadays. Um, 
in an early version, and that's what I also would like to tell you, uh, one of the, my PhD students was uh, looking at this, working through the details, and then he was asking me, well, but if I look at the books on convolution, and actually most of the mathematical books, they would define the bounded, um, the convolution of two measures by doing an iterated integral applied to the function of f of y plus x. So because it's mu one of x and mu two of y, they would say we take the tensor product of those measures, which is just the product measure in a way, but you apply it to f of y plus x. Now, clearly this new function as a function of two variables is not decaying at infinity. And that's another problem that we are getting here. So why can, how can we apply this tensor product to a function which is just continuous and bounded, but not decaying at infinity? So we will need to address this issue as well. Um, but at least I would like to tell you, I'm not doing anything different. I'm just doing uh, the same thing differently. And that's of course important because otherwise I would have my kind of private language uh, to express things and you would have to translate back and forth. No, no, we will have the same stars for convolution that we have before. And of course, uh, at the moment it's really, and it's helping hopefully you to distinguish between the signals f and the functionals mu. So I'm saying I'm producing from two functionals mu one and mu two a new one which I call mu one convolved with mu two. It's an internal multiplication. And then I'm writing a, a applied to F. So you can say it's the convolution operator. So why don't I just simply write mu one convolved with mu two convolved with F is the right hand side or so. Well, if I would do it like here, I would have to apply Fubini theorem, all these uh, measure theoretic tools or so, but also I would create a little bit more confusion hopefully uh, not uh, producing confusion now, by saying the star here between mu two and mu and f is a star of the action of a functional in the spirit of our systems, whereas mu one with mu two is another one which is internal. Um, the message that will come through in the course is at the end, you should be free to write mu one convolved with mu two with uh, convolved with f, use associative laws or kind of rearranging brackets and it's all well justified, but not yet at the moment. We have to verify that this is true. However, if you uh, just would do it and again to say how important the discrete measures are, if you would say, no, I would like to understand it by resorting to the discrete measures. And I would say, okay, by approximation, it's enough if you understand the finite discrete measures. Oh, they're just sums of del direct deltas. So we understand the deltas, they are corresponding to translation operators. So then you would say, well, what if you apply the convolution of delta X with delta Y, it's delta of X plus Y applied to F. It's of course the same as first applying the shift operator, let's say TY and then the TX, but also the order doesn't matter for those discrete measures. So really the important thing will be how can we verify the commutativity by approximating in a suitable sense by the action on a given F, uh, the measures uh, by the general measures, the general functionals by the discrete ones. Yeah, so uh, uh, <clears throat> this was, was a, a part of the argument I don't want to go through here. Uh, it was uh, the, in my calculation, how to uh, write the convolution product on the F as the measure mu one applied to some function G and that function G is what is coming inside of this. And this is exactly if you write it out in more precise form and in a more measure theoretic way, it's just G of X is just integral uh, as a function of X of F of Y plus X D mu two. So you see the flip is helpful to get rid of the minus or so. And now if you apply the mu one to this, it just means another integration d mu of two. Again, the commutativity is not resorting from this. It's just telling you that the formula 81 that you find in the books is the same as we have here. 
Now, uh, the, probably one of the main uh, points in the next session will be to understand what I call this discretization operator. So I call it deep psi mu, uh, and the deep psi mu uh, will be a discrete measure arising from the measure. The total mass or the size of this discrete measure will be at most the mass, or the total mass or the norm of the measure mu. But if you describe, yeah, discretize more and more, you will see that, so yes, the size of this partition of unity, now this is a function of size of, say, is this is convergent. So recall these partitions of unity are like Riemannian sums. They're the good ones which are corresponding to fine partitions of unity and the kind of coarse ones. And we are saying if you make the partitions of unity finer and finer, we'll create measures which are finer and finer. And actually these measures will act as some of the shift operators. So kind of one of the messages, once we have proved this, will be the convolution operator with an arbitrary measure is more or less a smeared version of convolution with discrete measures, respectively. The convolution with a measure is nothing else but a, an appropriate limit of finite linear combinations of shifts. We only have to choose these coefficients. I mean, we get more and more shift parameters, therefore, as it is with Riemannian sums, the coefficients have to be smaller and smaller, but in, the, in their totality, we mean uh, the bad description would be to have infinitely many, infinitely many, infinitely small contributions, which is kind of nonsense. It's a philosophical statement, not a mathematical statement. But the claim is, if you want to approximate your well-defined measure mu convolved with psi, you can do it by choosing any of your sufficiently fine partitions of unity, the shape of those doesn't matter, and you will get a very good approximation. Now, uh, I think I have to switch to back to the other, not to my own notes. I hope this, yeah. So this was just in preparation of this and, and as a starting point for the next one so that you can take a look at this. Uh, the discretization operator, I will call it the joint operator to the spline operator. So we have an operator which assigns, let's say, to every function f in C0, the piecewise linear interpolation operator, and I call it sp psi. And now there's an abstract machinery saying whenever somebody is giving you an operator that maps a Banach space into a Banach space, there is also an adjoint operator which maps the dual space into the dual space. You know this in principle, even if you haven't heard about functional analysis from your linear algebra course. You know that every linear operator from Rn to Rn is given by an n by n matrix. Well, but uh, the dual space of Rn as column vectors must be the row vectors. So it's Rn taken as row vectors. I mean, how can you map row vectors into row vectors of the size n? And of course, the answer is, well, instead of multiplying from the left, as we are used to do it, we are multiplying from the right. And if you keep this pairing of row with column vectors and you combine it with matrix theory, then you find out it's exactly the A prime, so the transpose matrix for real matrices, and the uh, and the uh, uh, transpose conjugate for complex matrices. Maybe even better, you have a matrix of size three times five, which, which maps R5 into R3. Then of course the joint spaces have opposite order in, the, in their dimensionality, and the joint mapping is mapping back from the dual of the target space back to the dual of the original space. So then maybe it's even more clear what are the dimensions and the transpose matrix of a three by five matrix obviously is a five by three matrix. And you have a very clear realization. I mean, just try to, to look at what is, uh, how do you compute the scalar product in MATLAB? I mean, if you have a vector X and you take the scalar product with Y, what you have to do is you do Y prime uh, multiplied matrix multiplication with X. Now, if you try it with A of Y, then you will see what we do. I think I will do it with MATLAB. Okay, so long story short, 
this deep psi mu can be defined either directly by saying, well, mu is a functional. I can apply to this continuous. We're not using box function. We're taking continuous partition of unity in order to create complex numbers or real numbers. And then we put a delta at the point xi, maybe the midpoint, the center point of this xi. The crucial property, and that's the one line proof which I try to skip here, just so that you are encouraged to try to look at it yourself, and but we'll do it of course, is that d psi mu applied to f is the same as mu applied to psi, s p psi of f. So, well, if you are taking an f, you apply the linear operator s p psi, then the linear functional, you're getting a linear functional. So there is a clear definition of a linear functional in this way, but the concrete shape is this one. Now, uh, once we have this transposition property or uh, a jointness relationship, we can check that deep psi mu of f must be at most, looking at the right hand side, the size of the linear functional times the input. But I told you the spline approximation or a quasi interpolation operator is non expansive, so you have the f. So this means the new mass is at most this here. But with a different argument, you can argue well, what is mu psi i? It looks like mu times psi, but it's different. I mean, you have mu psi i as a measure which acts locally by letting mu applied to psi i times f. Here we have now a measure applied to a function. So it's a number here, it's a complex number. And that complex number is a delta, but it's true that actually the size of the, the absolute value of this number can be controlled by the size of the measure mu times psi i. That's what we will use. And then it's clear the sum of those psi i's was adding up to the size of this. So another way of proving the last inequality instead of using the jointness relationship would be, we control the size of these coefficients. It's kind of measuring how much mass do we have. And the, the best we can say is, that's at most the total mass that we have in the measure, which is the size of the measure, and that's why you have this. So the point will be for our considerations. Whenever you are starting with a linear functional, and that's maybe the thing which describes your linear system, we can approximate it by a bunch of discrete measures, but this discretization is made such that you get a bounded sequence and the size of the limit is exactly this, this here. I mean, it's the uniform measure and the limit you have equality. So it, there's no better constant, but you have a very good constant on this. So we have a collection of discrete measures, which in some sense, as we will see, is convergent to the measure mu. And this will be exploited further in, uh, in the lecture next time. And this will help us to introduce also uh, um, the free transform and understand that we have this uh, expected commutativity property. Okay, I will stop now and uh, the recording.